it's week eight, the last week. Congratulations for making it this far. And we have saved the best till last. And it's very important if you want to get the amazing results that I get for my clients, that you implement every single thing that I have spoken about in the last eight weeks. I've added all the written information for this week, as well as the steps into the checklist. So if you downloaded the link to those in week one, and if you go to them now, then you can follow along with me. If you didn't download them, uh, then you can do that by going to the description of this video and signing up for them there. The Kindle version of the written document is also available for anyone who prefers that over a PDF. The Kindle version can also work on an iPhone and an Android phone. Unfortunately, Amazon won't allow me to put it on there for free. So it will be the lowest price that is possible given the size of the document. Just a reminder of why I'm teaching you everything that I know that I do for my clients that works. It's because I want to pay forward the help that was given to me in the past. If you have been finding these videos useful, then please like the videos. Also, please share them with any business owners you know who have a local business where they want people from their local area or anyone who has an online store. You never know how useful they might find it too. In week seven, we covered the website URL structure and keyword research. A reminder again of how much time you would like to invest in SEO and what kind of value that's going to bring to your website. So if you are able to do two hours a week, then effectively you're investing $1,000 a month of SEO into your website. In a competitive industry where you have more than 10 people competing for your keywords, you may need to do SEO for like two to four hours a week forever. But in a non-competitive industry where you've got less than 10 people competing for your keywords, then you can get away with a lot less time investment and you could even possibly stop SEO at some point in time and see how you go and then maybe restart it again or maybe just spend one month out of every year doing some extra SEO on your site. So in week eight, our main focus is going to be the on-page SEO. So we're going to run through all the things that you need to do on the website to optimize your pages, blog posts, products, recipes, etc. So this part is going to take you through the one-off setup tasks for these blogs, pages, products, recipes. This will ensure that the website needs far fewer links to rank in Google. So if you don't do this, then you're going to need to do a whole stack more backlinks in order to get your pages to rank. And even then, it's still might not rank unless you're going to use this very, very powerful on page SEO stuff that we're doing. So in some ways, I've kind of left the best for last, the part that has you know, some of the most powerful impact on your SEO. So these tips will help ensure that the website doesn't have thin content or duplicate content, both of which hinder rankings for the whole website. So thin content is where there's less than 200 words on a page. And if you have like multiple pages like this on your website, you know, and sometimes they are pages you don't even know exist on the website, then it can definitely hinder your rankings. Also having duplicate content. So this is when you have the same content on multiple pages of your website, or you have the same content as another website that can also hinder your rankings. So it will help Google know exactly which pages to show people, therefore increasing the relevance and your leads conversion. Conversion. <laughs> Okay, so firstly, what we're going to go through is setting up the SEO plugins because that's going to make a critical part of this ongoing SEO a lot easier. Now, 95% of my clients are on WordPress, so I'm going to run through Yoast SEO as the example. That's the one I've got years of experience with. I know it inside and out. Uh, once I've worked with Rank Math, then I will add a section for that into the book as well. If you have some kind of other CMS other than WordPress, then 
you know, like we've said, you want to research online, make sure that you've got some kind of plugin functionality or some kind of functionality. So you might as well watch this section just so that you know how it all works and what you need to look for in your system to see if, they, if there is something similar to that in your system. Now Yoast SEO is always changing. So I'm going to put a playlist link in here to a playlist that will always have like the latest video for the latest version of Yoast SEO. And then you'll also be able to go back to, to previous version videos as well. Okay, so we're gonna run through some of the general things that you need to look for in Yoast SEO. So the first thing is the knowledge graph and schema.org section. So you want to go under search appearance, which is, so you've got the SEO bit, you go to search appearance, then you go to general, makes sure that you select organization and then you want to put in your organization name and logo. So you can put in those two sections there. Okay, so then under the, what I call indexing section, but it's not actually called that, but it's, it's to make sure that you do actually index the right pages and posts of your website. So you want to go under search appearance and then either content type, taxonomies or archives. And this is where you can set all your posts and pages so that they, to, to tell Google whether you want Google to show them in the search results or not. In the past, this was under a section called titles and metas. Now this is like really important. This is the section where you can get rid of a lot of that thin content that might be hindering your rankings. So the first thing we're going to look at is under the, the section that's called content types. And so under here, I tend to set all the pages and posts to yes, the products to yes, but in most cases, the rest of it is set to no. Um, and so if you want to have more information about this, then you can have a look on the video, or if you've got any specific questions, then just put a comment in this video so that I can do one maybe for your website if it's got something that is very different to what we're going through today. So you go to the SEO under search appearance, you go up to content types and in here it's going to have posts, pages, testimonials and then a whole stack of other things potentially. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it just has posts and pages. So these ones, posts and pages, I set them to yes. But things like testimonials, I'll set them to no. Now that's because you actually have like a testimonial page on your website. And so that is actually going to be classified as a page here under this pages section. And so that is going to be one that Google can access. But what we don't want is every single individual testimonial to have its own separate page. We don't want a separate page for each testimonial because that's going to create duplicate content. You'll have the testimonial on the testimonial page and then a separate page for that individual testimonial. And you probably don't even know that those even exist on your site, but they do. So it's, it's thin content and it's duplicate content. So it also creates thin content because you're going to have most testimonials are going to be way less than 200 words. So in practice, I have seen loads of sites that have this thin content. And then when I go in and, and put no on all of these things, I see a huge improvement in the rankings that doesn't have all that thin content out there anymore. So then we've got the section taxonomies. So this is the section that tends to have like the categories and tags, product categories. Now, if your site was just a blog, and you wanted people to go to a, a category page. So it's just gonna be like, so just say your, your, your category is um, plumbing. So you've got a plumbing category and all these different blog posts on your website under plumbing. And so then when somebody searches in Google, you don't, if, you're, if they're searching for your, your main keywords, you don't want them to find like, the plumbing category of your blog posts. 
you want them to go to the plumbing services page. So just remember that WordPress was started as a blogging platform. And so if you have like a, a big blog and that's the whole aim of people just going to, you know, a whole stack of blog posts about plumbing, then that would be fine. But for local businesses and online stores, you never want anyone to go to a list of blogs or tags. You don't want Google to send anybody to something like that. So I will always set the categories and tags to know so that I'm saying, please Google, do not index these. If you have a shop or an online store, then you can set the product categories to yes. That would be fine, but we don't want the blog categories and tags to yes. Um, so if it has other tags and categories, I also set them to no. So you only want Google to find your pages, blog posts, products, and product categories. Anything else is set to yes, it can harm your SEO. So this is what it looks like, and this is a taxonomy section. So you go SEO, search appearance, taxonomies, it's gonna have categories, tags. I set them to no. Usually the only thing under here that I'm likely to set to yes would be if it was um, the product categories. In some cases, I don't even want Google to find the product categories because if you only have two or three products on your store, then the product categories might only have one product and then it would just be a duplicate of the actual product itself. Okay, so then we've got another section, archives. So I'll always set the author archives and the date archives to disabled. So you're going search appearance, archives, disabled. You don't need these author or date archives. The only reason that you might need them if you were some massive online news website or something like that, where you've got a whole stack of different authors and people want to, to search for that particular journalist or author. Um, and if the, the date that something was written was really important, but in, in um, local businesses and online stores, that just creates a whole stack of duplicate content that you don't need. Then there is the media section. So you want to make sure that the images that you've got in your media library don't create their own page. I've seen websites where they could have, you know, a hundred listings in Google that's just an image on a page and nothing else. And you don't even know that that's something that um, is, is showing up on your site. So what you want is under search appearance, media by default, it's set to yes, and you want to keep it that way. In past versions of the Yoast SEO tool, I had to tick uh, no index for the media section under post types uh, in order to make sure that we didn't get all the different images having like an, their own pages. Okay, so the next section is the XML sitemap. So in the latest version, you need to go to SEO general, and then you go to the features, and then you go down and you click on this little question mark, and then you can click here to see the XML sitemap. In past versions, you had to manually set up the sections in the XML sitemaps, and it had it over here. But now what happens is that whatever you set up under this search appearance is automatically what happens in the sitemap, which kind of makes sense. So the XML sitemap, when you click on that link there, it'll take you to something that looks like this and looks like this. And yeah, so this sitemap is not something that the general public usually looks at. We've talked about the difference before between the HTML sitemap and this one here, which is the XML sitemap. But it's really just to kind of show you, this is what we're asking Google to look at. So on my site, um, at the moment, it looks like the case study sitemap is also activated, but there's actually no posts or case studies on my website. So, um, there's only some pages at the moment anyway. Uh, so what I'll have to make sure that I do is that when I go in there and actually put in some case studies, uh, I'm not gonna want that page to be showing up in the sitemap because then it's just gonna create duplicate of this one. 
So then we've got this thing called cornerstone content. So if you go SEO general and then you go to features and the question mark and then you can click on this link to find out more about this cornerstone content. Uh, for most of the local businesses, the service pages on the website are going to be the cornerstone content and for uh, online stores, it's going to be probably your, your product pages. So we've already shown Google that these are important by linking in the navigation menus in the top and the sidebar, etc. Uh, by make, marking it as cornerstone content, you can then go to the pages and you can see how many links go in and out of these pages. So this feature looks like really interesting. I have to say um, for transparency, I've never actually used this feature for any of my clients' websites. And um, it, because I would be doing this kind of manually myself anyway when I'm setting up the site. But because you're not really familiar with doing all of that, it certainly might be worth um, going and having a look at the, the instructions for the cornerstone content and see what they're suggesting with respect to linking, internal linking within your website. Then we go to the, the social section where you can add all your social profiles. So you go to the SEO bit, social, accounts, and then you want to add all your profiles in there. And you can also go and put things in the Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest section if that's relevant for you. And then the last bit is the tools section. So this is the bulk edit editor, and that can be used to like easily edit the SEO titles and meta descriptions. So usually to edit them, you're going to have to go um, in and out of each individual page. But if you go to the bulk editor, then it enables you to edit things more quickly. OK, so what I'm going to run through now is the on page optimization overview. And do a bit of a summary of each aspect. And then what I'm going to do is run through each of these aspects on the very, very specific pages. So many people think that putting the keyword phrase in the page is what you do for SEO. Now, believe me, if it was that easy, then we wouldn't need SEO agencies at all. But that's kind of the overwhelming thing that, OK, we just need to put keywords in the page. So we've just done seven weeks on SEO <laughs> without putting keywords in any pages, right? And then we've got eight areas here, places that you should optimize with keyword phrases. And only one of them is the content. So I just want you to realize how unimportant it is to put keyword phrases in the page compared to everything else that we're doing. And if it really was that simple to just put them in there, then everyone would rank. Yes, once I have done everything that we talked about in the last seven weeks and I've done everything else, then I'll look at putting keywords into the page, specific keywords into the page, if the page isn't ranking for that specific keyword phrase. But in many cases, I can rank for all kinds of keyword phrases without it even being in the content at all. So that's a really important point to think about. Uh, and that everything that we've done around SEO how vital and important that is compared to just putting a keyword phrase in the content of the page. OK, so I'm just going to show you here, just run through so, so that you've got an idea before we go into the specifics. So the domain name is going to be like largehope.com. The URL of the slug is where I've got SEO and WordPress. Then we've got the page title, which is the which we want to set up as a heading one, which is SEO for WordPress. And then we've got the subheadings, SEO services for WordPress. And then we've got the SEO title here, which is a bit hard to see, but that's because of the plugin that I've installed for Chrome. Like you won't see this on your website unless you've installed that plugin. But in the back end, that's where we're putting in the SEO title and the meta description. 
So now I'm going to run through those. So the domain name, you know, this was discussed in the first week. And the idea is to have at least one very relevant keyword in the domain name if possible. Now, if yours doesn't have that already, then it can be, you know, a big hassle and you could lose rankings and it could be a big problem if you try and change the domain name. So keep that in mind. But it, it's very important for local businesses and online stores, if possible, to have some kind of keyword in the domain name. But it's not important at all for big brands, businesses that provide multiple different services. So like, for instance, for me, Large Hope, and that's not a keyword phrase for anything that I do, right? Um, but I'm going to be doing SEO services and I'm going to be doing ebook publishing and I have the kind of personality where it's highly likely that I will come up with something else or some other kind of service. I might sell off the SEO service part of my business, you know, in five or six years time or something like that. And I might just be focusing on ebooks. So for me and my personality, it's going to be much better that I don't have a keyword in my domain name so that, so that it can be whatever it needs to be. And then I will focus on making sure that whatever relevant keywords are in the rest of the URL. So if you go up here and have a look, you can see that it's got SEO and WordPress there. So I'm putting the keywords in this URL section of the pages that I want to optimize for that. But I can't have like my domain name being Large Hope SEO if I'm then going to be doing books, like publishing eBooks on all kinds of topics maybe to do with business. It wouldn't make sense to have SEO in my domain name. So you're just going to work out what works for you. If you're a local business and the only thing that you do is plumbing, then having plumbing in your domain name is going to be potentially very powerful. But if not, then you want to make sure that we're putting plumbing in the URL. So as we discussed last week, you want to put keywords in the URL section. Then we've got the SEO title and from my experience, this is the most powerful place that you can put the keywords. So that's in this section here in the back end. You don't see it on the page itself, but it's in the back end and it's the part that shows up in the Google searches. Then we've got the meta description. Uh, Google says the meta description doesn't actually help rankings. Uh, it's this part here, but I believe it helps on the click through. So I've put whatever I put in the SEO title, you're limited for space, but in here I can put more information that might help people. So here it just says WordPress SEO services, but here it's got WordPress SEO for local business and online stores in Australia and like a lot more locations. So it might be something where people will be like, oh, okay, I will go and click through to that website. So the meta description can be really important to getting people to click through to your website. One thing that you can do to get ideas for the meta description is go to Google, type in your main keywords and then have a look to see what your competitors are writing or what's being written in the ads and making sure that you're putting something like that in your meta description. Then you've got the page title. So this is usually where you have the heading one. So you need to have like one heading one on your page and ideally, if possible, it should be different to what's in the SEO title. So see how in my SEO title I've got WordPress SEO services and here I've got SEO for WordPress and then I've got SEO services for WordPress. So we want to have and then in the URL it's SEO WordPress instead of WordPress SEO. So you want to try and have different variations in different places. Uh, so we only want one H1 per page. Then we've got the subheadings. So these can be H2 or H3 headings like this, where again, you want to try and put keyword phrases into them. And uh, you can have multiple H2 and H3, etc. headings. Then you've got the content needs to be unique and interesting. Having the keyword just once, maybe all that's necessary. But like I said, I have also, you know, ranked websites where we don't have the keyword 
in the content at all. So the content part is obviously these bits in between the headings. Then we've got the image file name and alt tags. So images have the ability to bring traffic to your website. So just think about that for a minute. Images are most helpful on sites where people search for images in Google Images and then go to your site. So we've got the file name and the alt tags are not always relevant for a local business, but they're usually very important for an online store. It just depends on what the photo or the image is. So the image alt tag and the file name is most helpful to SEO if the image is something that's relevant to the keyword phrase. So just say I'm trying to rank for local SEO. So see, I've got the file name local-seo.jpg. Then I've uploaded the image that is an image that shows a computer with the words local SEO. And then in my alternative text or the alt tag, I've put local SEO company Sunshine Coast. So within your system somewhere, there should be the ability to put this alt tag or alternate text in there. The way that you get the file name is that you just do that on the image itself before you upload it to the website. So for a local business, if, if it's an image of a person being massaged and that's on a page about sports massage, then you would have the alt tag on the image, sports massage your city. So up here you can have sports massage, sunshine coast or whatever it is. Now it's unlikely that someone's going to search in Google images for an image on sports massage if they're looking for somebody to do sports massage, they might search for, for a school project or all kinds of things, but it's, not, it's unlikely that they actually want your service, right? But if you have this alt tag in the image, then it can help your SEO. If your page is about sports massage and the picture is a picture of a sunset, then there's not going to really be any point optimizing it for massage because there's not, it's not a picture of a massage. And there's no point optimizing it really for sunset either, because if someone searches for sunset in Google images and then goes to your page about massage, like it's totally irrelevant to them. You know, they're, if they're looking for a sunset image, they're not looking for massage, right? Um, another example is if the image is of plumbing pipes and it's on a plumber's site, then you could have an alt tag of plumbing pipe repair your city or something like that. But again, it's unlikely someone's going to search in Google Images for a picture of pipes if they actually want a plumber. But again, it can help to have the alt tag in the image. So you don't want to waste too much time optimizing images on local business sites unless the image is highly relevant and can therefore potentially help with your SEO. However, on an online store, if you sell furniture, it's going to be really helpful to have furniture keywords in the file names and in those image alt tags. If you sell clothes, then you want to have keywords that describe the clothes in the file names and the image alt tags. So for an online store, then just about any product, it's useful because you can use it to help your SEO to optimize the file name and the alt tag. Um, and people will search in Google images for products and then come to your website and buy from you. So it can be incredibly useful for online stores, not only for the SEO, but also to actually increase your sales. So now we're going to run through an example of each type of page and all the sections where it's important to put keywords and optimize them. Okay, so the first example is oh, the home page of a website. So in this case, the home page is prodexcharleston.com and the keywords that we're optimizing it for are dex, deck, dex charleston, dex charleston, South Carolina, deck builder and deck builders, etc. So all these keywords are highly related. And so that's why I can optimize the page for the, 
this range of keywords. I couldn't then, if I then tried to put in pool decking or um, some other kind of commercial decking, like that doesn't work because it's just, it's too unrelated and it's too competitive compared to these. But in Google's eyes, I know from experience anyway, that decks and timber decks that Google is going to rank them all on the same page. However, if you're not sure, then you might put your equivalent of timber decks as a totally separate page and and just focus on Dex and Dex Charleston. Um, and again, you can see we've got sort of deck builders. So the, the reason that I can put all those three different variations of keywords in there is because the domain name has got Dex Charleston in it. So it's got a main keyword there. And then, so that's also in the URL. And then, and then the SEO title um, could be Dex Charleston SC. So that we're covering all of these keywords here. And then we've got Timber Deck Builders. So we've got Timber Decks in there and we've also got Deck Builders. And so that's like a creative way to be able to target all of these slightly different keyword phrases but still very similar for the home page and we always want to put the most important keyword at the start so in this case Dex Charleston is the most important keyword that people search for they search for that more than they search for timber deck builders but if it was the other way around then you could have timber deck builders Dex Charleston so you always want to make sure whatever is here is the most competitive and hardest keyword that you're trying to rank for. So then we've got the meta description. Now, because it's a home page, you can actually list all the different services in there. So we've got projects, specialists, timber deck, but as many years experience, building selling long lasting decks, shutters, siding, roofing. So we've got all of that in there for the home page. If it was a page that was just targeting shutters, then you would only talk about shutters. But because of the fact that people might see this listing for the home page and want, and therefore they're looking at all the things that you do, then I might put that in there. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'll just put it about whatever we're targeting the home page for. Now the page title. We're going to have timber deck builders Charleston and then we're going to have subheadings throughout the content that are things like this so all of these have got various versions of the keywords in it as well so it's got deck building timber decks building services etc I just want to go back and point out the differences here so we've got Prodex Charleston so we've got Dex Charleston here and then we do have <clears throat> Dex Charleston in the SEO title. And then in the page title though, we've got Timber Deck Builders Charleston. So we, we try and mix it up a bit. We don't wanna just have Dex Charleston, Dex Charleston, Dex Charleston everywhere. Google likes it better when it has a combination of these. Now I used to go and put Dex Charleston, Dex Charleston everywhere. Um, and then some guys in the US uh, did some testing and they showed that if you change it up, you actually get better results for everything. So I did that and they were exactly right. It, it worked better for my clients' websites for them to rank for all of these keywords if we use different versions of it in the SEO title, meta description, page title and headings. So then in the content, we're going to, to put these keywords, they just be naturally scattered through the content. They only need to really be in there once. And what we want to do really is avoid using the location attached to the keyword if it makes it hard to read. So if in the sentence you can't, you can't put Timber Dex Charleston because it sounds really silly, then don't put it there. Make sure that you've got Charleston and you've got Timber Decks in the content 
but you don't want to have them so that it's, it sounds silly and doesn't make sense. So you also notice that some of them will contain multiple keywords. So timber deck builders contains the word deck, it contains timber deck, and it contains deck builders. And so often you can put, you know, a keyword into the content that is covering a lot of the different phrases that you're trying to target. And then you don't have to use the words as often. So when you've used each one of these in the content, you can then use them again if you, if you need to, but only where it would make sense to do so. You don't want to overuse these keywords. You don't want to have timber decks, timber decks, timber decks in like every single sentence. It just doesn't read well. And, and we'll go into um, like what's important when you're writing the content uh, in one of these other sections today. So then for the image alt tags, so you're going to put images of decks on the page. So you can add keywords to the file name before you upload them. And then you add the alt tag when it's uploaded. So the file name might be something like this. So PNG for the image or JPEG. And then this might be the alt tag that you're using. Okay, so the second example now is going to be a location page. So last week we went through uh, a lot of this on how to do the location pages and the service pages, URLs to structure it properly. So just say you did have a location page. Now this one is going to be optimized for plumbing, plumbing Austin, plumbing Austin, Texas, it's residential plumbing, commercial plumbing, emergency plumbing. So that's a lot of things that we're trying to optimize this page for. And like we went through last week, it may well be that you can't get it to rank for all of those keyword phrases. And then you need to create new pages that are specifically targeting just commercial plumbing Austin or just emergency plumbing Austin, etc. But just for the purpose of this example, we're going to try and target all of these keywords to start with, and then we'll see what happens over time. So the domain name contains the word plumbing. So we've got that in the domain name here. The URL has got the word Austin in it. You can see that there. And look, if the, if the word plumbing was not in the domain name, then you could add it in the URL. So we'd have plumbing Austin there. Then the SEO title could be Plumbing Austin, Texas, Residential, Commercial, 24-Hour Emergency. Now remember your space is limited to like 600 pixels. So depending on you know, what the location here, if this location was like super long name, then obviously you're not going to be able to fit everything else in there. Again, we want to put the most important keywords at the start, which is this one. And I never put the business name in the SEO title because it's just too precious to waste that space unless um, you start creating separate pages for all of these and, and then you have plenty of space because there's not very much else you can put in there. So, but if we're trying to target these keywords and we actually don't even have enough space, then I definitely don't put the, the business name in the SEO title. I mean, if you've got the business name in your URL anyway, which most people are going to do, then you really don't need it in this SEO title. Now the meta description could be something like this. So it's talking about everything that's very specific to the keywords that we're trying to target. And, and remember, this doesn't really help with rankings, but it helps people to click through to your page. So that's where you're going to put things like many years of experience or whatever it is that it seems that other people are putting that, that could be helpful to, to make people want to click through to your page. So the page title, the H1, should be different from the SEO title. So it could be Residential, Commercial, Emergency, Plumber, Austin. So you can see that's different to what we've got in the SEO title here. We don't have, we don't have Plumbing Austin again. 
And then in the subheadings, it's different again as well. So we don't have Plumbing Austin in there. We have Residential Plumbing Austin, Commercial Plumbing Austin. I mean, it's got Plumbing Austin, but it's, but it's a different version of it. And then in the content, again, we're going to scatter the keywords at least once. You want to avoid using the location attached to the keyword if it makes it hard to read. And so these are the phrases that you're actually going to put in the content. So residential, and, and you can see that these are things that you would be naturally writing in the content anyway, right? But it wouldn't really be that natural to write residential plumbing Austin as one word. So what you could have is something like, um, you know, fix plumbing, uh, residential plumbers in Austin, Texas, something like that. So when you've used each of these in the content once, then you can use them again if you need to, but only if it makes sense to do so. You don't want to overuse them. And again, with the image alt tags, you want to put images there with plumbers so that you can add in the, the file name, residential plumber Austin, Texas, if it's a picture of that, and Austin residential plumbing. So again, as I said before, uh, very unlikely that someone's going to go to Google Images and search for plumbers and so it's not going to really help to bring traffic to your website but putting this in here is supposed to help SEO. Uh, I've never been able to really do a test to see what happens if I just change the image alt tags and nothing else but it, it's sort of a well-known SEO thing that this is supposed to help and so in, in those cases we do it just in case it does actually help. Usually, unless there's some research at some point that shows that it harms it in some way, then we would keep doing what is supposed to help. Now we're going to look at an example service page. So as for example, we're going to use yourchiropractorcharleston.com and the Gonstead Technique service page. So this page is being optimized for a variety of different keywords, but they're all similar with respect to Google and respect to this particular page on the website. So you can see they've all got Gonstead in them. So the domain name contains the words chiropractor Charleston. So that's going to certainly help to rank for any of the uh, Gonstead Chiropractor keywords with Charleston in them. Then the page URL contains Gonstead Technique and that's because that is the keyword phrase that we've determined is, the, is, is one that we want to use. Um, we'll see if we go and have a look at the SEO title. We've got Gonstead Chiropractic which is the um, keyword that we're using in the SEO title and so that's the main one that we're trying to target here so we're going to say that that is probably the most important keyword but in the URL we're putting Gonstead technique to make it different and then in the meta description we've got something there that's going to try and encourage the person to click through the page title, Gonstead Chiropractor Charleston. So again, that's different to what we've got in the SEO title and it's different to what we've got in the URL. So the subheadings, which will have the H2 and H3 tags on them, could be why Gonstead Chiropractic, what is Gonstead Technique, etc. So we're putting, we've got Gonstead in each of these as well. In the content, we're going to scatter the most important keywords at least once. Like I've said before, avoid using the location if it makes it hard to read, which it does in most cases. And so we're going to have these phrases that you're going to have somewhere in the content. So blah, blah, blah is, is a Gonstead chiropractor. Uh, the practice, our practice is in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, we use the Gonstead technique, etc, etc. 
So once you've used them once in the content, you only have to use them again if it seems like a good idea to do so based on what you're wanting to write on the page, only where it's going to make sense to do that. Then we've got the image tags. So again, you want to have an image that's relevant, someone getting a gone set adjustment so that you can put the file name as something like this and then use the alt tag as one of your keyword phrases as well. Now we're going to look at an example blog post for the Fix Plumbing site. So as we mentioned last week, you can use the Google Keyword Plan or Answer the Public to find questions that people are asking that you can write blog posts about. Otherwise, we really are just guessing. And you really want the content that you're writing from an SEO perspective to be worthwhile. You want it to be something that people want to know and that people are going to type into Google and then come to your website for. So you can use the keyword tool. We're going to enter some keywords like this below. And then if you're lucky, there's a lot of questions that will pop up. So if the average monthly searches are over 100 in your state, then it could be a good topic. If the search volumes are under 100, you need to look for something that has multiple questions on the same thing. So for example, I put the like these four plumbing phrases into the Google keyword tool and we're going to have a look at the results in the image below. You'll see that there's, there's three searches to do with showers that are underlined in red. And so therefore we could write a post about plumbing a shower. And you could also write the instructions for how to plumb a shower. So if we go down and have a look, so each of these keywords here has somewhere between 10 to 100 searches. So you can see there's all kinds of things, how to plumb a sink, how to install a shower valve, how to install a washing machine drain pipe. So you can see they're all very different, right? So if you write a blog post just on this, I mean, this data isn't entirely accurate, but you know, if it's somewhere between 10 to 100 searches a month, you might not get very many people at all that are going to come to a post on this. So what we want to look for is keyword phrases that are, are similar so that we know that people are interested in this and they're typing it in in lots of different ways. So we've got how to plumb a shower. We've got how to plumb a shower drain, how to install shower plumbing. So you can see that all of these keywords are related to shower plumbing. So as we went through last week, you would ideally set up blog categories to match any services that you provide. So you're going to have potentially a category that's on residential plumbing. So when you do your blog post, you put that under that category. And even though we don't want anybody to, to go to the blog category, because then it would be fixedplumbing.com category, residential plumbing, we do want people to go to this residential plumbing service page and we can create this URL so that that is the whole blog URL. So you want to keep searching in the keyword planner until you run out of ideas, save all your ideas in the spreadsheet. And then you can go to answer the public and enter plumbing. And if we scroll down, we'll see that there was all of these things that came up when we used answer the public. So what plumbing is required for a dishwasher, what plumbing is needed for a dishwasher. So we, we can see that people are asking a range of different questions around plumbing a dishwasher. So then what you do is you go back to the Google keyword tool and see what has the highest searches. And sometimes you need to widen the search to see what mo is most popular. So instead of just looking at your state, or your local area, you're going to look at, say, like the whole of your country to see what is the most popular keyword. So you can see we've got dishwasher plumbing, plumbed fridge, tumble dryer plumbing, washing machine plumbing. So we can see that dishwasher plumbing is, is very popular. And so it is highly likely that people are going to be asking a lot of questions around dishwasher plumbing. If we go just to a state like Texas in the country, we can again see that you've got dishwasher plumbing, tumble dryer plumbing, washing machine plumbing. But from this, because it's similar search volumes, you wouldn't necessarily know which one is more likely to be the most popular. Like when we did a countrywide search, we could see actually it's more likely to be the dishwasher plumbing. So 
So then you could do a blog post on plumbing required for major appliances. So residential plumbing required for major appliances. And that's going to be like a really good social media post as well, because it can have plumbing uh, information on plumbing for dishwashers, fridges, tumble dryers, all of the ones that we put in there. Uh, otherwise, you could do a blog post that's specifically to do with dishwashers. So residential plumbing required for dishwashers. So we're going to optimize this blog post now residential plumbing required for dishwashers. So the keywords that we're going to be optimizing it for, what plumbing is required, what plumbing is needed, dishwasher plumbing installation, blah, blah, blah. So you can see that the domain name already has the word plumbing here. And then we've also got it here. And so the URL has basically residential plumbing required for dishwashers as which we know that plumbing required for dishwashers is something that people are searching for. And then we've got what plumbing is required for a dishwasher in Texas. So then we can use the fact that maybe there's different rules for different areas. And then the meta description could be something like this, which is encouraging people to contact you. We've got the page title, plumbing required for dishwasher installation, which is different to what we've got in the, URL, in the uh, SEO title and the URL. And then we can have all kinds of subheadings throughout the content which are relevant. And then in the content itself, we want to scatter these keyword phrases. So you want to have them at least once in the content, but you know, you, you're not necessarily, you, certainly something like this, what plumbing is required for a dishwasher, that's going to be difficult to have more than once in the content. And sometimes it might have to be, you know, a, a title because it just isn't something that you could write in the content of the page. And then we've got your image alt tags. So again, you're going to have some kind of image to do with dishwashers dishwasher plumbing, dishwasher installation, Texas. Again, unlikely that somebody who wants help with plumbing for dishwashers is gonna search in Google Images, so it's not really gonna bring you traffic, but what it can do is help your SEO. Now we're gonna have a look at some recipe optimization. So if you don't have recipes, then obviously you can skip this part. So when it comes to recipes, it's okay to have a recipe page because people do search for recipe keywords. So in this case, it's a good idea to have a recipe page with all the recipes and then a separate page for each one. So you would have Holistic Health Austin and then recipes. So it's gonna be optimized for whatever is relevant. So it could be healthy recipes, healthy gluten-free recipes, healthy dairy-free recipes, etc. So in this case, we're going to assume that all the recipes have a gluten-free option and optimize for that. So this is the domain name up here. We've got health in the domain name and we've got recipes in the URL. So it wouldn't make any sense to have recipes in the domain name unless your whole website was just about recipes. Uh, the SEO title for this recipe section is going to be healthy gluten-free recipes, meals, snacks, and desserts. And then we're going to have a meta description that's going to encourage people to click through to the page. The page title is going to be gluten-free recipes. And then the subheadings would be usually whatever the actual recipe name is, because it's, it's like a page that has know all of the recipes on it. Uh, so there's going to be very little content written on the recipe page because it's really just listing all the recipes that are in the categories. Just take that out. And then with the image alt tags, so the images are going to be really important on a recipe page because people are going to search and get Google images for recipes. People can also pin the images of the recipes on social media and share them. So images will be important. And if the page is a list of recipes, then it's just going to draw the data from those recipes anyway. 
Um, but sometimes you might have um, a category image that you can optimize. And so then again, whenever you get the option with recipes, you would definitely be putting in a relevant file name before you upload it to the website and some kind of alt tag. When you've got an individual recipe page, so just say it's um, recipes and then it's healthy chocolate cake. Now remember all the recipes on this site are going to be gluten-free recipes, uh, but it could just, it could be that, that your recipes are, you know, all kinds of random recipes, but usually you would probably have some kind of a theme to it unless your site was, you know, just purely um, recipes. So you're going to optimize it for whatever is relevant. So this one's going to be a gluten-free chocolate cake, healthy chocolate cake, raw, vegan, dairy. So, so whichever one is actually relevant. So what we're going to do is in the URL, we're going to have healthy chocolate cake. And, and that's quite good because if we find that nobody is interested in the chocolate cake recipe that you put there, it gives you the option to change the recipe later on. And, um, and then you can change the SEO tiles without having to change the URL. So the title could be healthy chocolate cake recipe, gluten dairy free options. And then you would have the meta description, which is encouraging people to click through. So the page title is going to be beetroot chocolate cake recipe because that's what it actually is. And so and we wanted the heading to be different to the SEO title. So it's very different there. Uh, the subheadings would usually be things like ingredients and instructions. And then in the content, you're just going to scatter relevant keywords in the recipe description and instructions at least once. So in in this case, it's it. In this case, the content in a recipe really isn't that critical. The critical thing is to make sure that you're just giving plenty of instructions, and you ideally want to link the recipe to some kind of product that you're selling. So usually, the whole idea of having recipes would be to link it to a product. So, for example, you may have a range of gluten-free flours or some eco-friendly containers for storage or something like that. And then in the image alt tags, again, we're going to have a, a fantastic image of a cake and then a healthy chocolate cake and then whatever the alt tag is going to be. So that will help with SEO. But in this case, people are also likely to come from Google images to your site. So it can help to actually bring traffic as well. So now we're going to have a look at product optimization. So some small businesses provide a service and will sell a few products. Um, for example, a chiropractor might sell pillows or other health related products. Deck builder might sell DIY products, etc., etc. So the service they provide is their main source of income and they mostly provide these products to their current clients. Uh, there is a possibility that someone may search for these products and then become a service client. Uh, so for example, if you if they want a DIY deck, but when they see everything involved in the process and they might decide to get it done for them. So there's, there's websites like that in service industries where you might just have a couple of products and that's what we're going to run through first before we then go and have a look at an online store. So if the business, business only sells like one product, then you could just create like a page for it like this. It's just latex pillows. Um, otherwise, you might have a couple of products and then you might have a shop and then, so the URL for the product might look like this. So again, it's going to be optimized for whatever is relevant. So if we use the example of the, uh, the latex pillows, regardless of which, the, which URL it is, uh, the domain name isn't related to the product. So it doesn't have like latex pillows in the domain name, but that doesn't matter because obviously the, the aim of this website is mostly to, to get people to come to the chiropractor. But in the URL, we do have latex pillows because you know that's what the product is. So the SEO title could be something like this, natural latex pillow for sale online and then whatever country that you're in. 
The meta description is going to be something that tells people about it and potentially why they should click through to your site and also might have something about the, the delivery. Then we're going to have the H1, which should be different to the SEO title. So something like natural latex content contour pillow. The subheadings, um, if the product description is long enough, then maybe you could have headings in it. But often with a product description, you don't usually have headings in it. Uh, and then you'd you know, scatter whatever relevant keywords in the product description at least once. But the critical thing with a product is to run, write a unique product description, particularly if you're selling somebody else's product. You don't want to have exactly the same description as what's on the manufacturer's website. So describe the product as if you're doing a review of the product with the things that are great about it and why. Um, if it's a high priced item, make sure to say why it's better than the cheaper options. You could do things, you know, who, who it's actually designed for. And then you could use videos to actually show the product in action. So people usually want a lot more information than just this is a latex pillow and latex pillow that has the latest technology, blah, blah, blah. Like they want to know much more information if they're actually just going to buy a product randomly off a site. Unless, of course, they've seen it somewhere else and then they just go to your site because your site is cheaper than the other option. But certainly when it comes to SEO, the more that you can write about the product um, that is a unique product description that no one else has of that product, the better it's going to be. Then for the image alt tags, um, again, because it's a product, it's going to be important. So on the shop page, people might search for images in Google. People can pin the images on social media and share them. So you want to put something in the file name and in the image alt tag because it's going to help for both SEO, but also to potentially bring traffic to your website as well. Okay, so for an online store, uh, when it comes to a shop, unlike service pages, like we've said, people do search for shop keywords. So in this case, it's a good idea to have a shop page with all the products and then separate pages for each product. So in this case, we could assume that uh, Prodex Charleston, maybe in this case, is an online store and all they do is sell uh, decking products. So you probably wouldn't be called Prodex Charleston <laughs> in that case, unless you were just gonna be specifically selling to people in Charleston. If you're a service business, like we've been optimizing this one for, and you're selling decking products, that's fine. But otherwise, if you, if you are purely an online store, then you're probably going to have a URL like this. So we'll go Prodex, and then these would be the, the URLs there. And I'll go back and, and change that um, so when we do the, when, when you see this, it will, it will just look like that. So shop pages are going to be like this, product URLs like that, and product category, something like that. So if we're going to optimize the shop page, then you can see that and also I want to note that a deck shop is something related to gaming. So even though that has high searches, it's not relevant. So you need to watch out for things like that, where it's not related at all to what you're doing, but it has high searches. So it's being optimized for these keywords here. So we can see that the domain name has the word decks in it. So that's definitely going to help if you're a shop that's selling decking products and, um, and then the URL contains decking products or shop. Because remember we were using potentially either of these URLs. And then so the SEO title could be buy decking products online in South Carolina if you only wanted people to buy them in the location close to you. However, 
it's more likely that this is going to be an online store servicing the whole of the country. Um, so, you know, we might put Australia in there as the country or Canada or the USA or, or whatever it is that your country is. So, or it might be that you sell to, to multiple countries. So you might have worldwide in there. But for this one, let's just put Australia for now. And then we're going to go, so the meta description would be Pro Dex has a range of quality decking products and DIY decks to buy online. We do deliver to all locations in Australia. And so then the page title would be Decking Shop. So obviously that's different to what we've got in the SEO title there. The subheadings are usually going to be the products or the product categories. Uh, the content, the shop is usually made up of all the products and the categories, so you're not usually actually being able to put any written content on the shop page. And then you've got the image alt tags. So again, people search to find the products, so the images could bring traffic to the site and they might pin them on social media. And it can also help with SEO. So any opportunity that you have to, to put something in the images that is relevant to, to what they're about is going to help with the SEO. Okay, so I'm just going to go back up here again because in this case you might actually use the home page as the shop page as well. So, so it could be the home page or you might have these internal URLs. If, you, if you're going to use the, the home page as you know the main one for this then you can still also have a shop page and then that's going to enable you to optimize that for a different set of keywords so you might optimize the home page for like buy decking what do we put here buy decking products online and then you might optimize the shop page for decking shop so if we now want to optimize the product page of a shop, so you're going to see the guide above for a single product because it would be the same as what we, we did up here for the single product. So you go through the same set of things. Now if you have one-off products, make sure the URL is generic enough to use for other similar products. So for example, if you sell one-off secondhand clothes then then and then you're ranking like a page that is about um, pink Levi jeans size 12 and then you sell that product then you're never going to be able to use that URL again so it was kind of a waste of of optimizing it and bringing traffic to it if you can never use it again so what you might do instead is have a URL have URLs for the products that are much more generic and therefore enable you to to reuse them but if you're getting if you've got hundreds of products that are going up on your site all the time then that's going to be a bit difficult to be doing that and so um, what you might want to do after you've uh, finished with a product page is that you might want to then just redirect it to a category page um, or you might just want to put something on there to say, um, you know, currently not available, please check out other categories or something like that. It might just be like a 404 page. In some cases, you know, it's fine to have 404 pages if you just can't create that product ever again. And then if we're going to optimize the product category of the shop, so take that away. Um, so only optimize these if you have more than three products in the category. Otherwise, you're going to really set it to no index. Because if you just have one product in the category, then it's just a duplicate of the actual product, but it's a worse duplicate. And you're just going to have like the duplicate content, etc., that we've talked about before. So only if you've got loads and loads of products is it worth 
keeping these product categories something that Google can find. Anyone who comes to your website obviously can still find those, that's not a problem. It's just whether you want Google to be showing that to anybody. And you don't, if there's only one product on there, you really don't want Google to show them the product category. You want them to actually show them just the product. So the next thing we're gonna look at is the content writing itself. So all of the content should be written so that people love it and want to read it. That's gonna be one of your key critical things. You're better off getting someone who knows how to write in a way that entertains and keeps people on a page than someone who says they know how to add keywords or I can do SEO writing. Like what you want is somebody who writes in a way that is going to keep people on the page so that they keep reading. That's what's gonna help SEO more than having someone who says that they know how to put keywords into the page. Like you've seen, it's actually very simple to put keywords into the page. You only need it once or twice in there. And how do they, if they're, if they're writing, how do they even know what keywords that you're trying to target unless they're the person that's done all the keyword research. So, so yeah, so it, that, that's not important. What's important is a good writer. Uh, as you can see, the previous, um, what have I got here? As you can see from in the past, yeah, so much more than having keywords on a page. You can rank for keywords, even if they're not on the page at all. Yes, absolutely. So you wanna make sure the content is engaging because 95% of the content on the page is more important for conversions than it is for ranking a website. So you want people to stay on there. And, and also, I mean, the, also the longer they stay on the site, the more helpful it is for SEO because Google's like seeing that people are actually reading the content. So it's vital that the content is easy to read. Now Yoast will actually give you a score that we'll have a look at in a moment. You want it to be entertaining. And, and sales, so it's not about having lots of salesy speak, but it's about and sells by keeping people on the page and engaged. It's not about having buy my product now, it's, it's about keeping them on the page. So it covers all things that the competitors cover, uh, is a similar length or longer than your competitors pages that rank for that keyword and is unique. So that means that you can't have any more than three words in a row that is the same on any other page in your website or on somebody else's website. If you copy the content of somebody else's website and rewrite it, you have to significantly rewrite it. But I'm gonna show you a tool that will enable you to see if you've rewritten it well enough or not. So firstly, you want content to be easy to read so in Yoast SEO and WordPress, you actually are given like a readability score. And so if you want your content writer to be given access um, to maybe to, to your website, and then they, you wanna make sure, that, ask them to get like a green face with everything that they write. And you wanna keep in mind that um, if the text has lots of tables and short sentences and the transition words may not be able to get to 30%. So, but overall we want like a green face on readia readability, which means that therefore the content is fairly easy to read. And like I said, you want it to be engaging enough that keeps people on the page. So that's what we're, having here so having your personality shine through on the page content will help um, having it engaging will help to sell you want to make sure that the content covers the things that your competitors cover so so what I do is I, whatever keyword that I'm trying to target I'm going to go and search in Google for that main keyword phrase and then I'm going to look at all the websites that rank for that keyword or phrase and I'm going to make sure that the page or post or product, whatever I'm writing, 
covers what the competitors cover and more. So I might look at the top 10 sites that rank in Google for whatever I'm trying to rank for and I see what they've got on their page and make sure that I have it on mine as long as it's relevant and that, that I'm actually providing that service. You also want to make sure the content is a similar length or longer than what your competitors have. So you can copy and paste your competitors content into a word counter, see how many words and make so if they have 400 words, you have 420 words. <laughs> you know, just make sure it's, it's longer than theirs. And you want to make sure that the content is unique. If it's copied from another site, then it's actually going to hinder your website. If Google thinks you've just copied content from someone else, then th that is bad for SEO. So you need to check it with a thing called Copyscape. So we want to do the unique content check. So I want to make sure the content on your website is unique. So the first check your site versus other websites. So you want to go and check all your pages, posts, recipes, anything that, that you really want people to go to. You go to Copyscape and you put the URL in there and then it will show you if it's... Um, duplicate or not. So hopefully there should be another video you can go to to specifically watch that if you want to. But it's relatively simple. You put it in there and then it's going to show you any duplicate content in pink. It will say your site is similar, has this much content that's the same. So if you're able to rewrite the content, then you want to have no more than three words the same in a row. Make the changes and then you can check the content straight away. Uh, now, in some cases, the duplicate copy may be a quote or something that legally needs to be written the way it is. So in this case, you should reference whoever the source is of that. So by doing that, you're telling Google you're using content from another site and then you're giving them credit. Now, the other thing that's important when you're checking duplicate content is that um, it is the content on the page that is important. So if the duplicate is like, say, like locations in a footer or something in a sidebar, then I don't usually worry about that. It's more about the content on the actual page that you need to worry about. So then the second check is your site versus itself. So you can check that with a program called SiteLiner. So you only do this when, when you aren't planning any more content changes and because you, you can only run the SiteLiner test once a month. So run it. If you want to then make changes, you can do that. Uh, but then you're not going to be able to test it again for a month. So SiteLiner will count any pages that you've set to no index as duplicate. So if you know that it's a no index page, then it's fine. But I'll also, there should be a, an extra video that you can click on to go specifically uh, to a video that I did about SiteLiner. Okay, so then what we want to do is look at some extra site checks after we've done all of this SEO. So you've done everything now in parts one to eight or weeks one to eight. And so we've just got a few critical checks that we want to do. So we did this much earlier on, but we now want to go to the Google search bar and type this in. So I want site colon and then whatever your website URL is uh, and then make sure there's no spaces between the site. You know, we don't want any spaces between here. What, what you can do is also just put this version in because sometimes that will bring you up more options of it. So, so usually that's what I'll actually put in anyway. Yeah. So it could be that or that. And what you ideally want is to see a list of your pages. So if it comes up like this and you can't, uh, there's nothing there, that's definitely a problem. <laughs> um, we certainly wouldn't be expecting that. Uh, so what you should get is like a list of all the pages on your website. So if it shows the list of pages that are indexed and you want to check through them all again, 
to make sure you only have website pages that you think are supposed to be indexed. So you want to go and click on all of the listings that it brings up and make sure that those are ones that should be indexed. The second thing that you want to go and check is your site speed again. We know that the faster site speed, especially on mobile, is better for the user. Uh, if it's better for the user, then Google likes it more. And ideally, you want to be faster than your competitors. So we went through that. Um, and, and again, this is something that, that you would then give to your web developer and see if they can do anything about it. Sometimes they can't because um, the data in these, in these programs isn't always going to be accurate and isn't always going to be useful. So you just get your web developer to, to check it over and then they can tell you whether there's any way that they can make it faster or not or whether it's relevant. And sometimes I'll go and have a look in the Google Search Console, which I showed you in earlier videos, just to see what the speed is. Because often, even though this tells me that the speed is high, when I go have a look in Google Search Console, it gives me totally different results. So. If you need any help with your website speed, then you just need to contact the web developer and make sure that, that there's nothing else that can be done and that it truly is too high of a speed, uh, too slow of a speed. <laughs> okay, so basically you have reached the end. Um, what have I got here? Yeah, so you can email me, you can put a request a video that's going to be put on YouTube. Um, if you also, if you want like a one-on-one -on -one session, if there's specific stuff that you don't want a video on YouTube about your business, then you can book a one-on-one -on -one session with me and we can record it. And then that can just be used for your private use in order to, to help you with your specific website. If you found this video useful, please like it and share it. And please do ask questions in the video comments. I will share any future videos that I make relevant to this in this video playlist. So you now have the option to watch some of those or you might want to go back to week one and start again and go right through the series again just to make sure that you haven't missed anything. Best wishes with it all and here's to your success.